So, what does an Imperial Japanese soldier, a panda, and the Abominable Snowman have in common? What the fuck? What's up, feature players? Welcome to another episode of Inebriated Antiquity. I'm Adam. I'm Tate. And welcome to the only show on the internet where we drink and talk about history. So, today we are covering uh, an Imperial Japanese soldier from World War II. And a panda. And the Evolved Snowman. But that's later. Anyway, we are covering Hiro Unai. A man who, in his mother's terms, was born stubborn and decided to show the world that by fighting World War II for like 35 years. Yeah. So let's get into it. So we're covering Hiro Unara. Yes. Uh, he was born 19th of March, 1922 in the Kamikawa village, Kaisu district, Wakayama prefecture, Japan. Uh, he was born of an ancient samurai family uh, his father was a sergeant in the Japanese cavalry during the Second Sino-Japanese War. Um, cavalry officer. Oh, yes. Uh, he died in China during the war. Okay. Uh, when Hiro was 17, he went to work uh, for the Tajima Yoko Trading Company in Wuhan, China. That's the place you get everything from Wish. Here, he would follow his father's footsteps and enlist in the Imperial Japanese Army. In the Army, Onada trained as an intelligence officer in the Commando Class Futamata at the Nakano School, specialized in teaching unconventional military techniques, including guerrilla warfare, sabotage, counterintelligence, and propaganda. December 26, 1944, Onada was sent to Lubang Island in the Philippines. Uh, two years earlier, the Japanese Army had taken over this set of islands, and they were just keep trying to wrestle control of from the Philippines government that was stationed there and trying to fight them off. It was pretty rough fighting, but overall it was a minor couple of battles for the Japanese military overall, because at this point they were fixing to tangle up with the United States and they were just trying to get as much territory as possible. During this, they sent Unada and his commando team. Uh, by the winter of 1944, most of the Japanese troops were forced out, and like I said, the only ones left on the island were Onada and his group of four people. Onada began using techniques the Japanese have been trying, uh, in which their outposts were close to being defeated. In conventional warfare, they would retreat to the woods and engage in guerrilla attacks. The intent was to prevent the U.S. troops from making strong footholds in the region delaying their ability to move troops uh, closer to Japan, and giving the Imperial Japanese Army more time to regroup and prepare for attacks. These guerrilla units, which also acted as spies, would also continue to be a thorn in the Allies' side. Seeing the impending defeat, Onada located three fellow soldiers and ordered them into the woods with him to engage in guerrilla warfare. He and his men survived on a diet of stolen rice, coconuts, and meat from cattle slaughtered during their raids carried out with the local Philippine Islanders. We'll call them troops, because he, he still thought they were troops. Yeah, in I mean, his eyes, they were still and they were for enemy like, combatants. I mean, for another like six months, but then, you know, the war ended. So mostly it was just a bunch of farmers trying to protect their livestock. So August 45 rolls around. The war between Japan and U.S. come to an end. Japan has surrendered, and Onada finally notices there's a lull in the fighting. Doesn't think that Japan would have ever surrendered, but of course, he had no conception of the A-bomb or the fighting that was happening in the island hoppings and all of that. So he's out in the boonies of this war, and just like, eh, maybe they've passed by, we're doing a good job, because we're keeping this island away. So yeah, he continues in his private war, basically. You know, he was fighting farmers, he was fighting locals. You know, he was keeping his men fed, but he didn't know the war was over. He even got into a shootout with police. 
you know, not even soldiers, these were guys in police uniforms. And he, still nothing sparked. You know, knowing the existence of the Japanese units, who had no method of communication again. These, these were the sticks of the war, so they didn't have direct communication to HQ. The, the United States actually made several attempts to try to bring news of Japan's surrender to these holdout locations, because they knew there were more than one. It wasn't just Hiro and his group. It was a couple of different places. So they went through, they went man to man trying to find them with military units. They airdropped the leaflets. They put out local papers. They, they did everything they could to get this through these holdouts that the war is over. You know, this we don't have to do this anymore. Um, Hero, the, let's see, first came across the leaflets in what forty-five around October. Yep. Yeah, and right off the mat, bat, he was like, "Japan surrenders, U.S. won." Nope, that's some bullshit. That Obviously, the lie. You know, of course, I get it. He was trained as an intelligence officer. This is what he was trained to do: counter counter espionage, propaganda wars, guerrilla tactics. This was, you know, one hundred and one in his mind. It's like, yeah, they're just trying to get us to come out. He was also raised with an idea of Japan still carried over from his family's samurai traditions, that there yeah. is no surrender. There's no surrender. By 1949, one of Inada's men, Private Yuichi Akatsu, had begun to believe that the war was over. Uh, he walked away from the rest of his unit. He, he abandoned them. Yeah, as you do after it's been, you know, four years. Four years. No, one's no going contact, to try to no soldiers, nothing from the, the Imperial Japanese Army. Yeah. He... Uh, he didn't go, he didn't turn himself in straight away. He held out in the woods, living uh, in a, 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 an abandoned hut for six months. Then he turned himself in. Okay, so it's, it's all right, I'm done with this, but I gotta make sure everything's still cool. I think he wanted to disassociate himself from the rest of the troops. Because again, once you start thinking that idea that this the war has been over, maybe those leaflets were right. Now he's getting into his mind does that mean we've been killing innocent people to survive? Yeah. I can see that. You know, got to get back into the maybe we're not at war mindset. Yeah, but uh, he finally surrendered to the Filipino Army uh, March 1950. Uh, Akutsu's surrender let the rest of the world know that the Japanese holdouts were still on Lubang Island. Uh, armed with this knowledge, the U.S. contacted the families of the holdouts and obtained family photos and letters of their relatives urging them to please surrender and come home. Well, These messages that. were now airdropped over the island in 1952. Oh, wow. I see, I didn't know this part. Yeah. Um, Onada recalled, we found leaflets and photos from our families. We had to assume that they were living under American occupation and had to obey the authorities to survive. Still, no thought in his mind that Japan could have surrendered. They might have lost, they might have been occupied. His family might be in an internment camp, but there was no chance that this war was over. You gotta wonder, what was going through his mind at that point? You know, it's like, okay, so we didn't surrender, but we've obviously probably lost. They've taken over our country. We've got our families hostage. But us three dudes, in the Philippines, if we hold out just long enough, we'll make it all better. I get that point. I guess he's just hoping the imperial military has shifted off to maybe mainland China and maintaining the war. Something. But yeah, but still, to make no moves to try to even contact them. That's that's some stubborn. I mean, his mama was not wrong. No. <laughs> the next two decades were hard for Hero and his troops. In 1954, uh, he lost another of his compatriots when Corporal Suichi Shim Shimada. Yeah. Suichi Shimada was shot and killed by a Filipino search party that was looking for the men. That's tragic. Yes. You know, you're not even killed in a battle at that point. These guys are yeah. trying to save your life. Yeah. And you end up getting into a shootout with them and dying. Uh, I feel bad for that guy. Then, in 1972, his last ally, Private First Class Kinshichi Kozuka, uh, was killed by the police while the two of them were burning a local village's rice silo. 
Well, because I thought I heard it was a farm raid. Okay, no, this was actually the entire warfare. This was the entire village's rice, rice supply. supply. Oh wow! Uh, like That's I said, so much worse than I was thinking. This was what he was taught. This is he was going to interrupt troop operations. You know, if the if the United States was still trying to maintain this island, cool. You've got an entire populace that's now demanding food. Onada was now alone, waging a one-man war against the Philippine government. At this point, after the return of Akatsu and the deaths of Shimada and Kuzuka, the Japanese public were well aware of, and in some ways, a little enamored with the story of Onada. I get it. You know, this is... This is a folk hero at this point. He is. I mean, this is like, yeah, we lost the war, but that, but that one guy is still bitch going. Is still going. He's been fighting him for, at this point, thirty years. Yeah, almost thirty years, and he's like, nah, he's still going. That's, that's the guy right there. Which leads to, um, a certain Japanese national, name of, uh, Norio Suzuki. And there's where we get to what these three things have in common. An adventurer uh, who had the plans to travel the world. Looking for Hiro Unada, a panda, and the abominable snowman. In that order. In that order. So, I don't know if he was going least likely to most likely to not exist, or least likely to most likely to exist. But Suzuki's wish came true. He arrived in the Philippines in February of that year and found Hiro Unara in the jungle within four months. Within four months of looking for him, he, he literally did what, what the Philippine government military and police couldn't do. Yeah. Hiro was initially uh, kind of wary of Suzuki, uh, but these worries were assuaged when the young Japanese man basically told him, and I quote, Onara-san, the emperor and the people of Japan are worried about you. Um, That's a very Japanese way to greet a man that, for all intents and purposes, you've got to assume is out of his mind. Well, that's the thing. But you think he's out of. You think that you're thinking a wild man. But as you can see from these pictures, yeah. this man was maintaining an immaculate uniform. It might have been ragged out, but he was maintaining a uniform. He still had over 500 rounds of ammunition. Grenades. His firearm was still in parade ready. Yeah. This man Sword, not lived a rust on it. this life. Like, like a, a general was gonna show up and inspect him tomorrow. Uh, Unada was, felt, less than thrilled. was less than thrilled for Suzuki. He uh, said, uh, his, his quote about him was, this hippie boy Suzuki came to me on the island to listen to the feelings of a Japanese soldier. Uh, I'm not sure what a Japanese hippie looks like or how someone from the 40s... Yeah, that's my thing. He hasn't seen civilization since 44. Yeah. In December. Yeah. and But he comes up with the idea of hippie. But he told Suzuki one thing. That he would not leave the island until he was relieved of duty by his superior officer. So, who's been retired for quite a while. So Suzuki returned to Japan later that year and told the Japanese government this was Anata's conditions. The government then tracked down Anata's commanding officer, a Major Yoshimi Taniguchi, who had since become a bookseller. They flew him to Lubang. Uh, Taniguchi went to Lubang Island and finally met with Onara and fulfilled a promise he had made back to him in 1944 saying no matter what, whatever happens, we will come back for you. By the age of 52, having been properly relieved of duty, Hiro Onara emerged from the jungle. Still dressed in his official uniform, he turned over his sword, a functioning Arasaka Type 99 rifle, 500 rounds of ammunition, several hand grenades. He also turned over, one of my favorite objects in his possession, uh, the dagger that his mother had given him in 1944 to kill himself 
Were he ever taken prisoner? With your shield or on it, sir. But he came out of the uh, jungle, turned over his weapons, turned and saluted the Japanese flag that one of the uh, troops was carrying. He presented, then presented his sword to the President of the Philippines in an act of surrender. The President of the Philippines then pardoned him for all crimes against the state. Which, if you think about the Philippine people, that's got to rub the wrong way, but for what the, the President did, that was, that was good. Yeah. That was an honorable thing he did because he's like, this guy didn't know. He thought we were still fighting yeah. him. Yeah, pardoning him was an unpopular opinion at the time. Um, but you can see why. But they have to understand, yeah. In this man's mind, this was still war. He then returned to, J to Japan to a hero's welcome. Uh, literally crowds applauding him as he got off the plane. Oh, yeah. Um, he was so popular, in fact, that uh, within a little bit of time, him returning to Japan, he was requested to run for the Diet, which is the... Uh, the Senate. Yeah, the Jap Japan's bicameral legislature. Uh, like I said, it was it was part of their transitional government, but again, it's uh, he refused. Um, although he did get involved in some right wing Japanese political uh, movements at the time. Well, he wanted Japan for the Japanese. Yeah, and he wanted to run World War II. Japan was not Japan for the Japanese. Yeah. But yeah, he, he wanted to return to traditional values. And again, a, a guy who's been removed like that, I, you, you, you understand. He, he might, it might not be what's best for the people, but you, you at least understand. Yeah, time has literally passed him by at this point. Yeah. But he spent his time uh, writing and releasing his autobiography, No Surrender, My 30-Year War. This book. Link to it below. De the, this book detailed his life as a guerrilla fighter in a war that was long over. Uh, the Japanese government offered him a large sum of money of back pay. Couldn't get exact numbers, but apparently it was pretty big for the time. He refused the money. Really? Refused the money. Uh, wow. When the money was pressed on him by the well-wishers, he ended up donating it to the Yasukuni Shrine. After the war, Onada was never fully comfortable with the land he inherited at this point. You know, the Japan was not the Japan he left. He didn't like where it was going, and he didn't like what he saw when he was there. Soon after that, as we said, he started using his fame and everything to get into right-wing politics. He wasn't comfortable with the fame that he got, but he tried to use it for better. He tried to make Jap Japan more independent, more, you know, Japan for the Japanese. But he also wanted to make it more warlike again. Yeah, he wanted, and, he wanted Japan to have a military again. Yeah, and as we said, this was a man that time had passed by. This was a Japan that had grew an entire generation that hadn't had war at this point now. They've been you yeah. know, completely at peace, and they were like, we don't really want to get involved in that kind of world stage anymore. This is Japan in the 70s. They were becoming an electronics powerhouse. Yeah, I mean, they, their economy was exploding. They were... They were doing great, and they were like, war will do nothing but ruin this. Yeah. So in the end, that made him uneasy. And in 75, this was just like a, a year later, yeah. basically. He, he, it, it didn't take him long. He literally just felt uncomfortable, uncomfortable in his own skin. So he took what money he had and his family. He moved to Brazil and started a cattle ranch. You know, And he lived that way for quite a while, just raising cows in Brazil and being a family man. Didn't have to yep. worry about Japan, didn't have to worry about anything. Eventually he did go back to Japan, but instead of trying to get involved in politics and everything like that, he took what money he had from Brazil now, put it back into Japan, and started making things like boys camps, almost like a Boy Scout thing. Yeah, he actually- That would into like nature and survival skills and just teach boys, and I don't know if it eventually ended up being girls as well, yep. but just, teach him to be one with nature. Like actually, I found more about that. Uh, he had actually become very disconcerted. He read a news article about a Japanese boy that killed his entire family. He just had, I guess, a disassociative moment and basically killed his whole family. And Hiro thought, 
that the return to nature, the return to those old uh, ways would be a way to try to guide the youth of Japan. He wanted to leave something that was going to help guide Japan. So him and his wife started these uh, uh, these, these so camps for the children. He kind of invented tree bathing. Yeah. Get you know get out to nature, get, let all the stress just go, and just yeah. enjoy being out there. Learn a couple of skills, and just be one with the earth that we live on. But as all things do, this story ends in January 6th, 2014, where Hiro Unada died of heart failure. The age of 91. Not only did he live in a jungle for 30 years, he still had the fortitude to keep kicking until his 90s. Yeah. I don't think I'll be here in my 90s. Uh, if uh, I make it past my 60s, I'm going to be amazed. Yeah. And he made it to 91. Unada's dedication, as well as fanatical belief in the eventual victory of Japan, of Japan led him to pers persevere through just some of the most difficult situations that you can imagine. I mean, you're looking at war, you're looking at raids, you're looking at jungle life. And it, Watching it, his friends get shot by the police. Or just, in his mind, betray him and leave. Yeah, like, he, the, the emotional depth he had to have gone through in the jungle, and especially those last that? years, that last almost, almost decade alone? Long. I mean, being alone, we are social creatures. Yes. And he made it, and didn't go crazy, which is amazing. But it shows us just how far values like loyalty and pride, determination and commitment can carry him, for good or for ill. Yeah. You know, this man was not a hero to all people. No. But today he is a hero for history. So, Hiro Unada, we salute you. That's been it for this episode of Inebriated Antiquity. We hope you've enjoyed it. We hope you like it. We hope you subscribe to it. We imbibe, you subscribe. And don't forget, hit that muffin button. Absolutely.